Hello my friends, here we are again for another video. This is a bit of a segue in the middle of our Daniel uh, study. On the last video we were studying Daniel chapter 11 and uh, we are still continuing with that study. But I, w I need to correct a mistake that I made and I'm going to add a resource to our studies. Um, now, when I was talking in the last video, we were talking about Daniel chapter 11 and the interpretation of it and how it came out of Oxford School in England. And, uh, that, and I, I made a comment that it was probably maybe 100 years ago because 400 years ago they didn't know that much about the Bible. Well, I was uh, very wrong in that statement, and I want to correct it now. Now, I have a Bible here that I'm going to introduce to you called the Geneva Bible. Now, what is the Geneva Bible? It was released in 1560 during the, uh, the tumultuous times in England. The England, um, see, when King Henry VIII in England, when he broke away from the Roman Catholic Church because he wanted a divorce from his eighth wife or something like this, um, that caused great turmoil within uh, England because just before that time, Martin Luther had made his stand and he had been publishing a lot of uh, papers. Uh, others have followed him. And the Reformation movement was in full gear. And there were many reformers in England and Scotland and in, the, in all the British Isles. Um, um, people like John Knox and... Um, um, John Fox, the Fox's book of, book of Martyrs, and others like this, Miles Coverdale. England was going through a lot of political turmoil at this time. King Henry VIII, he had secular reasons to set up the Church of England because he said, why should England be run by a pope in Rome, in Italy? Uh, we'll set up our own church, and that way I can get the church to do what the, things the way I want it. Now, this uh, started the uh, Protestants who wanted to break away from Rome. That started a movement. That, that was sort of the, the, the uh, infancy of the Puritan movement in England. And... They wanted, they, they wanted nothing more than to have a different church than Rome. One that they could run according to the scriptures. Because the, the, the biggest um, contention during the Reformation that the Protestants had was the scriptures were not being followed. They were being uh, set aside... Um, set aside as a lower priority than, than church traditions. And the Bible was being translated into different languages, like German and Dutch and English, by uh, much earlier by Wycliffe. And uh, people were able to read it. And so now they were able to criticize what the priest was teaching them about the Bible. Because they were saying the Bible doesn't say that. So this was causing this rift between the Protestants and the Romanists in those days. Now since then, Rome has moved somewhat more in the direction of Protestantism. As, as lifting the Bible up to a higher level than they had in those times. Um, and now they kind of 
do the best they possibly can to make the Bible say what they teach. Uh, but if you really look into it, nah, it doesn't it doesn't really say that. <laughs> so, anyway, when King Henry VIII died, his son, Edward VI, I believe, was, uh, he was a part of, he, he was open to the Protestant movement. And during that time, see, uh, Tyndale, had, William Tyndale had already been burned at the stake for writing his English Bible. And it wasn't, he never really got to finish it. And, uh, but it was very, the, what he had produced was very popular in England. But it, then it was made illegal. And he um, eventually, the, he, he authorized the Great Bible to be put in all the churches of the Church of England. So the Great Bible was um, sort of like a um, inspired by Tyndale's Bible. So this is like the, the Bible being made in English officially by the government of England. So uh, by the King of England. So uh, this was big, big moves happening regarding Christianity because the Pope was dead against this because they had the Latin Bible, the Latin Vulgate, and they considered the Latin language as a holy language and the Latin Vulgate was the holy book and nobody could translate it into any other language. And only they were the ones who were allowed to interpret it. Or, or who were even able to interpret it. So this was a, a beginning of a, a great revolution in humanity where, no, we are going to get our Bible translated into our own language and we will interpret it ourselves. So thank you very much. So this was the, there was wars fought over this. So the great Bible came out, but then when Edward the sixth died, um, I think he left a, a, a woman, Lady Grey, I think, on the throne. But Edward's sister, Mary the first, she was Roman Catholic, and she was the daughter of King Henry the eighth. And she uh, overthrew this Lady Grey, and she got to the throne. And she decided to turn England Catholic. And uh, she earned the nickname Bloody Mary because um, she, um, there was people being burned at the stake all over England. It, it became illegal to have an English Bible. And anyone caught with one was liable to death. Um, they, were, they were being burned and confiscated right so the reformers who's named in the, i'm looking at a wikipedia ar article here on geneva bible who who do they name in here um you know john at this time john calvin the great reformer he was the leader in geneva switzerland and these reformers from england Miles Co Coverdale, Christopher Goodman, Anthony Gilby, Thomas Sampson, William Cole, and others uh, fled to Geneva from England because they were going to be killed. They were going to be burned at the stake. They all worked together to produce another Bible, another translation, an English translation of the Bible. And this was the uh, English Bible, the first English Bible that had the chapter numbers and the verses numbers put into it. Um, those were developed in a Greek edition made by another scholar in Europe.
named Erasmus, a Roman Catholic, by the way, or leaning on that direction at least. So anyway, um, so they went to uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and they made this Geneva Bible. And I happen to have a copy of it right here. It's a, it's a facsimile of the 1560 Geneva Bible. And the thing about the Geneva Bible is that it's very old English for one thing. It's a little bit difficult to read. But also, let me find a place. You'll see there's what they call the marginal notes. You see all these, all these notes here in the margin. And at the bottom, usually, over here, there's all these notes in the margins. Let's find a place where there's lots of them. Some places are, have a lot of these notes. Especially in prophecies. Daniel chapter 11. Look at how many marginal notes there are. And at the bottom too. They, they put, they translated it into English. And the whole Bible has these notes written by the reformers. By these reformers who were the beginning of the Puritan movement basically. And they were figuring out the Bible as best they could. This was brand new stuff. Um, a lot, some of them were educated in universities and mostly Roman Catholic universities. And so they had a lot of this knowledge from the priesthood. They were, lo they were educated in the priesthood, uh, some of them. But it was all in Latin and it was secret knowledge, kind of. They, they didn't discuss it with laymen. It was improper. So they made this Bible with all these notes. And for Daniel chapter 11, I entered these notes from the Geneva Bible into my Bible. Because I wanted to compare them to see, like, what did they say in 1560? Literally 475 years ago. So here we are. And what I found very surprising is that they followed my video that I made so far, the beginning half of Daniel chapter 11. They followed it almost exactly the same interpretation as the, the Oxford Study Bible, um, as the, the same as the modern theologians today will interpret it because it's pretty obvious what it's about it's about the uh, the Syrian and Ptolemaic kingdoms fighting with each other and they got it dead on mostly like they only missed a few small things mostly they got it dead on all this here that I wrote in purple this is the, from the Geneva Bible notes so I'll scroll, th I'll, I'll scroll through it slowly in case we have a nerd on here that wants to uh, copy through it. Uh, all the purple. Now, the beginning part here, the, that's my translation. This is the Hebrew, the verse number there. This is the Hebrew translation, of my English translation. This is the Geneva note in purple. And then below that will be my notes for doing my video. So there's verse 3, Alexander the Great. That's Geneva, says the same thing. Verse 4, same thing. Pretty close. It is, it's still talking about the Diodashi, Alexander's generals. Verse 5, the king of the south, Ptolemy of Egypt. Exactly. Verse 6, Bernice, the daughter of Ptolemy. Ptolemus, they called them, right? And um, same thing, same thing as modern times. Verse 7, 
Uh, the death of Bernice. Verse 8. Ptolemus reigned 46 years. That's all the Geneva Bible says about that verse. Um, there's my notes on it. Verse 9. Uh, they didn't put any notes in verse 9. Verse 10, they put uh, um, same thing as me. The sons of uh, the the sons of Seleucus the second, Antiochus and Seleucus. But they they're using their also their their um, sir, their given names. Okay, so pretty much the same thing. Verse 11, there's a Geneva note on that one, which is um, not as detailed as what we have now, but still the same interpretation. They didn't have a note on 12. Verse 13, same thing. Ptolemus Epiphanes, that's Ptolemy V. It's the same as my notes. Battle of Panium. But they, they don't mar mention the Battle of Panium and all this, but they're talking about the same kings. Okay. Verse 14. Antiochus against Philip, king of Macedonia. Well, they, go, they deviate a little bit from this one about, they're talking about the violent ones of your people shall lift themselves up to establish the vis vision. They interpret that as... Um, um, many shall stand up to the king of the south. So they're saying, well, King Philip of Macedonia was standing up to him. And also, and then their interpretation of the violent ones of your people is the same as the Oxford one, Onias, the high priest. But I refute that um, because I explained that in great detail in my previous video. The one just before this one. Okay. Then uh, Scopius. I didn't mention Scopius. But he was representing. The. Uh, the kings I was talking about. The Tol Ptolemic king. Okay. Verse 16. The Roman. Now we differ in this one too, uh, where the Geneva Bible will, will agree with the Oxford Study Bible. Um, but I, I deviate a little bit. I'm saying that this is a preview of Rome. He that comes against him, against Antiochus, will do according to his pleasure. None will stand before him and he will stand in the beautiful land. And here's the part that does not fit with their interpretation it will be consumed by his hand. The beautiful land will be consumed by his hand. Well, that fits more with Rome changing the name of it to Palestine and destroying Jerusalem. So I say this is, this is Rome entering the scene and this is sort of like an introduction. This is the new player, Rome. Okay? That's what I say this verse means. And then the Roman Seleucid War. Um, I explain all about the Roman Seleucid War, but then verse 17 starts to talk about the Roman Seleucid War. And uh, Antiochus the Great, right? And he gave his daughter Cleopatra, same, same interpretation as everybody else. Verse 18, um, same interpretation, pretty much. He, he um, a little bit different here. I think this is closer to the Oxford interpretation too, where Antiochus had um, tried to embarrass the Roman counselors and ambassadors, but ended up getting embarrassed himself. Okay. So it's still talking about the uh, Syrian-Roman War. Okay. 
The first mention of the Romans in the Geneva notes, for fear of the Romans he shall flee. This is Antiochus the Great. For when, he, when as under the preten, pretense of poverty, he would have robbed the temple of Jupiter, Dodonus the countryman slew him. So then he, 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 uh, he died. And so it's still talking about um, the same interpretation as the death of Antiochus the Great. There's uh, Seleucus, um, and he was killed by treason, treason of his, uh, treason of his, um, Heliodorus, his servant, right? And this is when Antiochus Epiphanes enters the scene. There they name Antiochus Epiphanes in the Geneva Notes. He was a vile and cruel and flattering nature and defrauded his brother's son of the kingdom and usurped the kingdom without the consent of the people. So yeah, okay, they're right on board with that. Um, that's my interpretation. This is the next verse, verse 22. Um, with the arms of a flood, um, Now I write. I I I had a little bit different view on this. Commentators apply this to Antiochus, as Geneva does, um, and declaring war on um, Ptolemy the sixth, declaring war on Antiochus the sixth, um, and all that happened from there. And then the Prince of the Covenant, uh, they call that uh, Ptolemy Pilomater's son, who was this child's cousin, Germain. Cousin Germain means distant cousin. So Ptolemy Pilomater's son was Antiochus' distant cousin. And he's called the Prince of the Covenant because he was the chief and all others followed his conduct. Well, that's a pretty weak interpretation. Where I interpret that differently, it'll be, it's in my last video. Um, and this is about where I ended my last video. So, you know, w when we continue, we're going to continue looking at the Geneva interpretation, comparing it to mine. Because I, because I find this very interesting. Now a little bit more about the Geneva Bible is this Bible was so incendiary, the language in it, against the papacy, that um, these people, when they made this Bible, they started to get it printed in Geneva and in Europe. And, and and shipping it to England illegally. Like you could be sentenced to death, burned at the stake for, for having this Bible and for shipping it into England especially. It was like banned, completely banned because of Bloody Mary on the throne and uh, doing whatever the Pope wanted, right? So th this was like, um, misinformation, disinformation, okay? So there was really strong censorship. Now I'll show you some of the language. Uh, I, ca I call this the Alex Jones Bible <laughs> because anyone who knows Alex Jones um, will sort of know what I mean when they hear the language in this Bible. Let's see what they say in here about Revelation chapter 17. It says, uh, chapter 17, verse 1. Then came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the denunciation of the great whore that sits upon many waters. 
with whom have committed fornication the kings of the earth. Now, they interpreted this as the Roman papacy uh, blessing each king in Europe who, who was at their inauguration and that a king could not be a king without the blessing of the Pope in Europe at this time. And this whole system, the Holy Roman Empire, that was being overthrown by disinformation, or actually the truth. Okay, so, but, but in the Alex Jones tradition, or maybe the Al Alex Jones is in the Geneva tradition, they, they go, they kind of go, they're talking about something that may be true but they go way over the top in their language when they talk about it to the point where people go, oh, this is just a bit too much, you know? So uh, here's what I mean, okay? So this uh, whore that sits on many waters, so we'll see how they explain this, which was... Christ Jesus, who will take vengeance on this Roman harlot, Antichrist, is, per is compared to a harlot because she seduces the world with vain words, doctrines of lies, and outward appearance, meaning diverse nations and countries. Oh no, each note is, it's got like the letter in the verse, and each letter pertains to a note. So, this beast signifies ancient Rome, the woman that sits thereon, the new Rome, which is the pap pap papacy, whole, whose cruelty and bloodshedding is declared by scarlet. Or symbolized by the scarlet, okay? Full of adultery, superstition, and contempt for the true God. You see, the, the language is just no restraint on the language, right? So, now, f for the reason, now this Geneva Bible, the whole thing, the whole Bible is full of these notes. On every, every single book of the Bible, they have their, they put their opinions on what it means. And so it, when, eventually when M Bloody Mary was overcome, and the Geneva Bible was allowed in England, um, this was everywhere. And, and this, w this sort of began, this is the beginning of the Puritan movement. And they used to call this a, a, a university education in one book. Because you could read the whole Bible and you could read the notes on the side and they'll tell you what it means. And you would read about all these ancient kingdoms and all these, all this history and all this stuff in these notes. So it was like a, a, a degree in theology in this book was the way it was considered. This book was brought to America on the Mayflower. George Washington was sworn in on this book. Thomas Jefferson was sworn in on this book, on the Geneva Bible. Probably the first five, six, seven presidents were sworn in on the Geneva Bible. Now, in 16, um, what was it? I think it's 1614 or something like that. The, that's when the King James Bible came out. When King James came to the throne, um, the, this book here, the notes in this book, speak against popes and kings alike. They have very... They, they, they talk about evil kings as, as much as they talk about evil popes. And um, the king of England 
said is this was very dangerous language and this language should not be in the Holy Bible so that's when they made the King James Bible to get rid of the Geneva Bible to because it was just too um, divisive to all of these things you know they, they wanted to bring you know there, there was a lot of divisiveness between Catholics and Protestants and the Protestants the Puritans especially were reading this Bible so in in the early days of uh, Massachusetts Bay in 1776 there was a lot of Geneva Bibles and about 50-50 Geneva Bibles and King James Bibles. So I just wanted to introduce this to you and since I got a little bit blown away that this information is in the Geneva Bible that early they had um, Greek history like down pat pretty good uh, that I thought that it would be a good idea from now on when when I'm studying these Bibles just to take a look in the Geneva Bible notes just to see if there's any anything really significant that we should look at that should be known so uh, that's why I'm introducing this Geneva Bible today or what I call the Alex Jones Bible and this is a direct facsimile it's a very beautiful Bible so I'll show you the, the opening page. It's, this is a famous page. It's a big Bible too. There's the opening page. And it's very old English, so it's sort of a bit weird, hard to read. The S's are F and V and U are the same and it's, it's got some strange language right um, strange to us and it's also got the Apocrypha in it there's a lot of pictures um, woodcuts and this this book here is a is a a, a facsimile, a, a direct copy of a 1560 Geneva Bible. Now this book here, because I guess it didn't sell as good as they'd hoped, it's no longer in print. It's no longer available. So again, it's become a this this has become a very rare Bible, but you can uh, find it online on uh, for free. You just Google it, Geneva 1560 Bible, if you want to take a look at it. So, thank you very much for listening, and um, it's a little bit of Christian history there for you. And uh, we will continue in the next video with our study of Daniel chapter 11, from where we left off. And we'll also... I've, all, I've already added the Geneva notes into just to reference it and see what did they what did they say about it what did they think of it and and then to say well what do we know now and make more determinations so anyway I'll see you next time and don't forget to like the video please it makes a big difference and also I've done a bunch of updates on the channel. I'm going to do a little video about that, just channel update video. So you'll be seeing that coming next. But I just wanted to mention right now, if you go onto my homepage into the community, there's a couple of polls in there I'd like you to vote on if you could. And um, I'm going to be doing a bit more community type of uh, atmosphere with this channel. I think it, uh, it's a bit better that way and it's getting big enough now it's, and we're getting ready for that. So we're going to community it up a bit. So thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Shalom.